Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 510. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Knoll, and today is Friday, June 14th, Black Day. Every once in a while, I can snag Stephen Knoll to sit down and talk vast theology, experience history and we can combine it to have an interesting show Stephen has agreed to speak with me today and we're going to talk a little bit about stuff but before we do that we need to talk about your responsibility as a viewer we need you to comment on the show you can do that on the youtube page or the facebook page you can share it you can subscribe to it you can listen to the podcast all the information is available in the show notes uh I'm thinking back here. The last time you and I sat down together, you had a bad cold. It was in Jerusalem in a hotel, and GAFCON 3 had just finished. And we talked a little bit about the future of GAFCON, what you guys have achieved so far, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about the distance one year makes. Because GAFCON seems to be the new player in town. It's uh, obviously matured. Uh, people are looking to GAFCON now for answers to some of these global problems in Anglicanism. And Canterbury and the Archbishop of Canterbury have all but sunk that boat. So you're, you're kind of the remaining game in town. How do you see that? Well, Kevin, when we last talked in Jerusalem a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, it was certainly a high, a spiritual high for myself and uh, the other 1950 people who were there. Um, physically, it was a bit of a low. I was had the thorn in the flesh after a, a week of uh, helping on the statement group, but uh, God was good, and I'm now well, and I think GAFCON is also well. Um, well, in this interim time, uh, the movement continues to grow. We've been adding more uh, provinces and uh, what they call branches, and there's been a call to have a bishops meeting, uh, all bishops meeting uh, in um, Rwanda uh, about a year from now. And uh, it isn't exactly a substitute for the Lambeth Conference, but um, maybe it is. And, um, and then just uh, this past couple of weeks ago, um, the new General Secretary Ben Kwashi and uh, Foley Beach announced um, a GAFCON Sunday in which uh, all of the partner churches in GAFCON uh, would be invited to promote it. And I thought that was really important. So first of all, I think they're uh, dangling a carrot for people watching. Go to the website and simply see this 30-minute uh, video from the conference last, um, last June. And I can't believe that you won't go away thinking, I want to be part of that. Because it really was a, a magnificent spiritual occasion, but it also stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the cross of Christ. And so I think that uh, in promoting this side of GAFCON, they're doing a very good thing. I'd like to be a bit delivering the stick side and saying that I think that all churches in the GAFCON movement, and I'll at the moment focus on the Anglican Church in North America, should consider it not only a, a joy, but a duty to identify themselves as GAFCON churches. And I'd also even suggest that everyone who are parishioners, who are members of these churches, should begin to think of themselves as global Anglicans, ought to think of themselves as global Anglicans. So that's my brief. Well, the global reach is increasing. Since we last talked, uh, GAFCON has hit the shores of New Zealand. Yes. Uh, again, a group that felt conscience bound to leave the uh, Anglican Church in New Zealand and form a new branch, as we call it, a kind of extraterritorial province. These things are all happening, I would say, among the leadership. Uh, what I would like to do is to, to get it down in one way to the local level. I'm going to tell you this uh, uh, story from my own diocese. Um, 
my bishop, who is a very godly man and is very committed to world mission, spoke to us about three weeks ago and gave a kind of a, a stair step um, uh, diagram of context from the personal uh, to the parish, to the network, to the diocese, to the province, and there it stopped. So during the question time, I reminded him that we were also part of a global communion of churches. Amen. And he immediately agreed with me, because of course he does. But my point is this, that it didn't automatically occur to him. And I don't think it necessarily automatic occurs to parish priests uh, or bishops, or and certainly not to the local people in the pew. And some of that may be the reluctance of what GAFCON is doing vis-a-vis -vis the Anglican communion. But more than that, it's what I would call the tyranny of the local. People tend to be focused on their daily affairs, perhaps their parish affairs. But when you start talking about a communion of churches out there, it's much harder to identify. And yet that's actually what has happened over the last 20 years. We've been drawn into this wonderful fellowship with uh, Anglican Christians all over the world. I wonder if one of the problems was just the, the trouble with the name, Global Anglican Conference. I know GAFCON itself tried to find a different name, find a different identity right. around the name, right. hired some consultants and said, listen, people are really identifying this as GAFCON, but we don't want to be GAFCON, we want to be something more spiritually yeah. named. Well, and, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it could easily sound like GAF prone, uh, yes. like as Trump or something. But, uh, but yes. actually, <laughs> of course, originally it meant the Global Anglican Future Conference that met in 2008. And though we tried other names like Fellowship of Confessing Anglicans, they just didn't stick. No. However, my argument is this, and this is why I'm using this word global Anglican. That's two-thirds of the way to saying global Anglican communion. Now, we're not there quite yet, but I think that's where we're heading. In fact, the statement uh, from Jerusalem said that we believe that God is reordering the communion. It says we're not leaving the communion, but we represent the majority of the communion. I think the day will come when global Anglican communion may in fact describe uh, what in fact God has done. The evidence is there that there's been a, a reorder. If you wanna look at the last 10, 20 years, uh, the, the old structures are starting to fall apart and there is something new happening within Anglicanism. And the people who are saying, stop, look what you're doing, are being a little bit more successful in keeping and growing their churches their diocese and their provinces, where the other ones who are kind of adopting culture are falling apart, whether it be in England, whether it be in other parts of Europe or here in America. And it's fun to watch from a historical perspective. Now, I am often asked, what is GAFCON? As a layperson, I go to a GAFCON church, I go to a um, church that's very active kind of a break off of uh, St. Paul's Darien a long time ago. And the people there are in the know, but I don't think they know how they're represented or a part of GAFCON. And I guess that message does need to go out right. and get out. It does. And of course, remember the GAFCON administrative staff is about less than a dozen people. Mm -hmm. And so we really do depend on uh, lower levels from the provincial level, the ACNA, which also is a bit of a bare bones operation, to the diocese, to the parish priests. And that's where my argument would be that we really need to have the people at the lower levels uh, take a role in explaining, promoting um, a GAFCON. And there's so many positive things, obviously the experience of these conferences, mm -hmm. but also what we're beginning to teach, like the Jerusalem Declaration, which is a very succinct statement of classic Anglican teaching. And uh, so I think in that sense, uh, we really need everyone to pull together. Uh, now, I know you're a very technical person. You're very astute and you know. <laughs> Are you talking about? Okay, go ahead. I have an app on my phone. I don't know if we can see that, get that little. Yes, I can here. see it. Okay. 
It says ACNA. They just put an app out. And this is not a paid endorsement at all. But uh, I installed the app off the website, and uh, it seemed pretty cool. Uh, it has Church Finder, About Us, Connect With Us, and Upcoming Conferences. I'll click on that. Oh, they have a College of Bishops meeting this week. Today? Yep. I can learn that through the app. So I think they're trying to get the message out, and uh, we shall see what happens. Okay, I have you on the line. I want to talk about holy orders and women. Uh, yeah. There was just a re uh, report released called Women in the Episcopate. Right. Uh, it was presented to the GAFCON leaders. And I want to talk about the conclusions and what you think of that. Okay. Well, first of all, here's the book, the interim oh, you report. Have it. <laughs> now and, you're showing uh, off. <laughs> and if you, uh, if you go to the GAFCON website, as of today, mm -hmm. and go to the resources section, you will be able to get um, the preliminary material, the front uh, introductory material, <clears throat> and the basic conclusions which the task force on women in the Episcopate uh, have made and have had approved by the GAFCON primates. Uh, my role uh, for the last four years has been as convener under Chairman Bishop Sampson Waluda, of a group of about a dozen uh, uh, representatives from different provinces, uh, different spiritualities, uh, men, women, bishop, priest, uh, deacon, um, and we have spent the last three years uh, in a study of the issue of women bishops in the church. Uh, now, we were given that particular focus for partly for a theological reason, because the bishops are the, the highest order of uh, ministry in the church, but also because uh, at this point, uh, while there are so-called different integrities throughout GAFCON on women presbyters or priests, uh, there have been no women bishops uh, in GAFCON, uh, one little asterisk there in South Sudan, um, but basically, that has not yet taken place, and I think the feeling was that we should come to one mind on uh, whether this is appropriate, whether uh, variety is appropriate, or whether there should be simply one order uh, for the whole uh, GAFCON movement. And so that was our task um, over these last uh, three years, and we, we did bring a recommendation uh, to the primates, which they approved. Um, in 2018, and they approved it again recently in Sydney. And what's that recommendation? Okay, let me read it to make sure I get it right. It is our prime recommendation uh, that the provinces of Gafcon should retain the historic episcopate on, on the consecration only of men as bishops until and unless a strong consensus to change emerges after prayer, consultation, and continued study of uh, scripture among the Gafcon provinces. Mm -hmm. So it, it has been to, to say we should keep things as they are until or unless uh, another consensus arises. Uh, so on the one hand, let me be clear for anyone listening, we did not make any recommendations with regard to women presbyters or deacons. This was limited to women bishops. We also did not close the door on the possibility of a woman being uh, approved as bishop. Um, on the other hand, uh, we didn't open the door either. That's what this until and unless means, that uh, until we come to consensus, we believe the historic practice should stay in place. So what the GAFCON primates uh, approved, again in uh, this past May, April, was that this task force should continue its work uh, in a somewhat different way. One of them, now that we've collected the, the materials we used, it's about a 350-page book. Uh, some of these writings have been available before. Some of them we produced. We want to have this as, as a study guide for uh, different churches, their leaders, theological seminaries and colleges. Uh, and then also we want to produce a more uh, 
layman's level, um, I wouldn't call it a catechism, or which would help people to understand some of the basic issues, like the whole issue of human uh, nature in God's image, male and female. Does that have an impact? The family. Then we want to look at what does it mean to have holy orders in the church, uh, and, and deacon, priest, bishop. Are there differences between uh, that? And there's a real argument that can be made that the bishop as the head of the overall church would be in a different role perhaps than even a priest. I know some people disagree with that, but on the other hand, historically, it's quite possible that the episcopacy emerged more from the apostolic delegates like Timothy and Titus than necessarily exalted presbyters. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are the kinds of issues that we would like to continue to, uh, to work on. Um, and also, we said continued prayer. Good news for GAFCON is it has a prayer network. This can be one of the things that they pray about, because as you know, from the history of the last 20 years, and even in the Anglican Church in North America, this can be a very divisive issue. It's always the issue of the day, and it's always an issue where everybody has an opinion, just not the same opinion. Right. Um, and you know, that's the kind of the, the nature of the church as well. I mean, we're going to have some things that uh, uh, divide us, and hopefully we can uh, be united through it. And it's nice to see that GAFCON has a formulary, but I want to be sure we're not doing what uh, the Church of England and the Anglican Communion has done over the last 30 years, and that's just kick the can down the road. Yep. Well, At some point, I you need to make a, a statement Unless God changes scripture and unless the Holy Spirit comes down, unless Jesus says it's time, we're not changing. That type of thing. I, I think one thing that's changed, if I may say so, sure. from the days in the Episcopal Church, you had people there who, frankly, didn't care what the Bible said. Correct. Everyone who worked together on our report uh, have agreed on the fundamental principle of the authority of scripture. There certainly are issues of interpretation, and in our report, we, we actually had two views, and we had various essays on interpretation. But the fact is, we did agree that God's Word is truth, and also that on important matters, we should look for harmony, Scripture interpreting Scripture. So while I think there's no question that this is a very difficult task before us, and I'm not sure it can be solved in you know six months, a year, six years, it may take we do believe that with continued consultation and uh, prayer and listening, good listening, not Canterbury listening, uh, good listening. In Daba, no. <laughs> that, that God's will will become clear. That we could say with the uh, apostles, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. Mm. But we're not there yet. No. Uh, I got you here. I also want to talk about something that happens in Africa and around the world when there's poverty. And that's the, the desire to be non-impoverished, to have a God who would provide for you in more ways than spiritual and your soul. And the kind of the topic of the day now in the last two or three weeks has been the prosperity gospel kind of breaking out in other provinces. And one of the things that I saw as a person who's visited uh, East Africa many times is that the prosperity gospel has always been a competition to the Anglican yep. church. Yep. When you drive by a prosperity gospel church, the pastor's driving the biggest Land Rover you can buy. The church has a C. Most of the people are there have some type of uh, financial means. And that is desirous when you are impoverished. It's kind of not surprising then that there's a little crossover going on uh, within provinces. And I wonder if you could speak to yeah. your experiences in Uganda and other places. Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that this most current issue that's broken out <clears throat> within the uh, uh, Kena, ACNA, I'm really not in the know there, so mm -hmm. I don't really want to comment much on that specific situation. <laughs> Yes, uh, clearly the prosperity gospel is very popular in, in much of the global south, um, and certainly was in Uganda where I was. I remember driving by when they were having big crusades with these billboards that said, 
get ready for Dr. Christmas Dollar. <laughs> and I thought, did he make that name up? <laughs> anyway, uh, he came and you know, they, they filled the whole uh, national stadium. Um, and the Anglicans are quite aware of uh, the Pentecostal uh, challenges here. I might say it isn't just poverty, though that's part of it. It's also celebrity, because we have the mm. same thing going on in our society with uh, showmen of various sorts. Sure. Uh, and, um, but, and on the one hand, I think Anglicans have felt somewhat disadvantaged by their prayer book tradition, doing things decently and in order, and in many places they've certainly loosened up in areas of liturgy and singing choruses and things like that. Uh, but on the whole, uh, they have not been going the direction of the prosperity gospel. In fact, um, I was invited uh, to give an address uh, about six years ago in Nigeria at what they call the Divine Commonwealth Conference. It's this big conference uh, held in Abuja, and they wanted me to address the issue of eschatology, of the day of the Lord, or the rapture. Mm -hmm. And I, I touched on the dangers if you think that uh, Jesus is coming or maybe has already come, that then you figure you can get anything that he you know, has to give you. Also, uh, I was uh, the moderator of a group uh, at uh, GAFCON in Nairobi in 2013 on the question of the Holy Spirit. And we both did scripture study. But then we had presentations, and one of the strongest presentations was by Bishop Michael Fape from Nigeria, mm -hmm. who came out very strongly against the prosperity gospel. So while there may be some who are tempted from inside Anglicanism to go that way, I think most of us uh, know that um, at, uh, at best, the health and wealth gospel is a distortion of the gospel. At, at worst, it's a false gospel. That's true. It, it's true. It's something we've got to keep our eyes open to. Uh, keep following the news and see what's transgressing outside the show. Uh, there's stuff we're not going to talk about on the show. Uh, we have used up 25 minutes of your time. I want to thank you, unless you got something else you want to talk about. Did we miss anything? Come back and see me in a year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> next year, a year before the next GAFCON. Uh, nine more years in Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, that's right. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Stephen Dahl. You've been watching episode 510 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>